So welcome everybody to our second section of our rhetoric declamations. Uh, we have a few prospective students watching along, so welcome to you guys. Uh, you all know the drill by now. We're uh, excited to be doing Copia today. Our first section of Copia, we're really good. I'm looking forward to this one as well. Of course, Copia are uh, from that book right there that Dr. Schlecht is holding up. Just uh, on Copia of words and ideas, a way to demonstrate rhetorical abundance. Uh, so the students are given the prompt to take a couple word sentence and expand it into 175 words, trying to really get that just drilled down and uh, explained and focused and, and really shown what it means, what those, what those five words mean. So really it's just a chance to be creative and to show your technique and your talent for uh, expanding, puffing up, uh, but not in a loose or airy way, but instead of a, a way full of content. So these are usually pretty exciting. Our list we have presenting will go in this order. McEachern, Meyer, Morgan, Miller, Rydell, Schumann, Strickler, Ricks, and Samau. So that's exciting. And uh, any questions before we get started? Or other observations, Chris? You want to inspire them on to good deeds or you just want to hear their good deeds? <laughs> I think that you were just so inspirational. It's just such a tough act to follow. See, guys, that's oh, that's how you get one. All right, just uh, if one just needs to out Erasmus the rest of the group, that's what we're after. Out Erasmus, everybody. Good. Remember, he was the one. How many times? How many different ways did he write the letter? One. This isn't really the same kind of thing, but. He wrote, I've received your letter 153 different ways. Is that correct? Yeah, it, it was your, your letter pleased me greatly. He wrote over 300 different ways. <laughs> now that's copia of words, which is different ways of saying things, but this is copia of thought or of ideas where you're, you're taking one idea and representing it abundantly rather than narrowly, so. Good, copia of ideas. Yep, the skills of Desiderius. I don't know how to say his first name. <laughs> okay, let's start us off, Gabe. Are you ready to go? Yeah, um, I'm actually doing the letter one, and I'm very nervous now because I didn't, I, well, I'll just read it now, but yeah, okay. I received your letter. Can I, can I interrupt here real sure. quickly, Gabe? I'm not, I'm not seeing yours submitted. Am I, did I miss something? Should be under the uh, discussions. I think uh, I did it the right way. Discussion. We, oh, it's not in the assignment tab, though. Oh, we, okay. Let me, okay. Yeah, do upload it to assignments if you get a chance. And right now, we'll just listen for this one. All right. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. I received your letter. It was just the day. The rusted mailbox was wet with rain, and atop it, the little red flag marked the brightest color on the street. I received your letter. The wax seal was a nice touch. It made it feel extra fancy. I should be responding with a pen and an ink bottle. I received your letter, and I can just hear the mailman's truck around the corner grumbling away, splashing puddles in the rain. I received your letter, brought it inside, and, as it seemed appropriate, set it down next to some tea and something that I think was a crumpet, though I'm not quite sure I know what a crumpet is. I received your letter. And now it is time to write. All right, good. We'll give you the digital claps. All right, Gabe, thank you. Uh, enjoyable. Now, obviously what you use, normally we pull it up on the screen, but I don't have it in front of me. And, but anyways. Um, I can try and post it real quick. On uh, well, that's fine. I'll just keep talking while you're, while you're getting it up there. You can let me know if it does get posted. Uh, so you use the frame device of the repetition of I received your letter, which is a good move because it kind of allows you to highlight. It's almost poetic in its approach because you're trying to highlight a specific element, how, what it looked like, what was in it, where you set it, you know, into the crumpets. Um, uh, but, but I also wonder if your delivery could help us. It, it felt like you were reading something that you've written which you are obviously, but as far, as far as a given presentation, you might want to make this vary the delivery of I received your letter. Cause it felt almost perfunctory the way that you, you said, I received your letter, you know, kind of 
you know, in a sense, what does it mean to receive your letter? Like, can you put some of that into your delivery of the I received your letter? That's kind of my first approach to that. I, I like the idea of a framing device and the repetition really helps humans get that idea across, but I need your delivery to help us know how to take each of those comments, um, if, that, if that makes sense. And I'm not, um, I'm not quite seeing the logic. For example, your crumpet joke, I'm not sure the crumpet joke fits, right? I mean, it's kind of funny, so I enjoy it, but it also is like, you know, setting it down in some tea and a crumpet is funny because we do that with letters, but I'm not sure the joke about like, it, it kind of rips us out of it, the meta narrative about what a crumpet is really fits your piece. Um, those are kind of my general comments there. I, I'm, um, yeah, I agree. Uh, with what Mr. Cole said, the uh, I do like the I received your letter repetition, um, and it's it's fraught with potential. What this seemed like, and I think, and it seemed like this especially because of the crumpet, the crumpet line, is it seemed like uh, several different scenes uh, that were just kind of put together and attached. Um, and it was stitched together in the way that like Frankenstein's monster was stitched together uh, rather than using the I received your letter to weave together a theme so that it unfolds more and more and more. That there wasn't an unfolding theme. It was more like here's here's one moment of receiving a letter now for something completely different. Here's another moment of receiving a letter and now for something completely different yet, you know, so um, maybe that's what Mr. Cole was getting at with the logic. That's my way of articulating that. Yeah, good. Any thoughts, Gabe, about how, is, I mean, did you have more of an organizing principle or was it really just kind of four different pieces I mean, of receiving I, uh, a letter? Yeah, I think, I think it was, I wasn't at all trying to make a common like narrative or anything like that, which I, uh, you know, I'd definitely be, if I had to rewrite it, I'd be, open to doing i uh i did try to order it kind of somewhat logically like he i he he goes out and takes it out of the mail bot like i tried to make them somewhat orderly but i understand that it's not it's not very uh connected yeah there's a slight well, temporal oh go go yeah and I, I, yeah I, and i did follow that there was the logic of the movement to the mailbox and coming coming in so and that was that was good but then is there a theme developing um, that's bigger than the is make a hole bigger than the sum of the parts I guess yeah good I think the action really is almost free verse poetry uh, but you didn't quite have the concentration necessary for free verse poetry to work um, but I did get what you were trying to go at that's right you and Ellen Ginsberg <laughs> receiving yeah you received a letter with the best of your generation uh, okay, let's let's jump on to Talis Meyer before we get into any more beat poetry. That's for a different week. Uh, Talis, you ready to go? I am ready. Closing the car door, I turn and face the beach. I've never seen such white sand before. Folding chair and book in hand, towel over one shoulder, I press forward into the shimmering light. The sun's angle is optimal for reflecting its hot rays off the sand. I am vulnerable to sunburn from above and below. I've never squinted with my entire face before. My cheekbone muscles have migrated to the bridge of my nose, flaring my nostrils and revealing my top row of teeth. A passerby would think my face was a white raisin with horizontal wrinkles. Yet now in my narrow vision, I see how long this beach is. The whole length seems to be lit up with white, it's a white simmering flame. This is not turning out to be the morning beach reading I was hoping for. Opening my book, I find myself looking into the, I find myself looking into the flash of a spotlight. Blindness would be a blessing at this point, but no, there is still some iris left. Digital claps. Thank you, Dallas. Uh, we would love to shout for you, but we're on Zoom, so we cannot. 
Let's pull up your piece in front of us. Of course, Talos is trying to expand the prompt, the morning was bright. Uh, I, I would say here um, some fun elements, right? But I, I think the idea of reading in the sun is a good idea because there is something painfully bright about that. You have to get to the shade. Um, but I guess uh, let me focus on a couple, I think as, as a way, a couple ways of pointing out how some metaphors aren't quite fitting right at the end. Um, the length of the beach, I don't know. I don't know if the brightness is what's coming across. Yeah, no, it definitely is. But right here, this last paragraph is probably where I felt you kind of wandering astray. Uh, because all of a sudden we have the introduction of the book. If you're going to have reading a book and the brightness of that, I, I do think uh, you do. Well, okay, you mentioned the book right here. But I think that that might be something that would be more helpful because you you need to you need to get us into opening the book and sitting down and kind of setting that up, but you almost skip over that, right? Right to that. And then you say the metaphor of looking into the flash of the spotlight. Normally we expect spotlights at night in the cold, and I just had a bit of a co cognitive dissonance here, trying to, trying to blend those two metaphors together in my mind. And then, at, and then at the same thing here, this is a bit abstract from before you've been, you've been kind of, you've been, exaggerating about how high your teeth go and what you're you know i've never squinted with my whole face was probably my favorite line out of this piece but the idea of the iris and, and you know blindness and getting blinded i wasn't quite sure how the iris played into that perhaps i'm just far too you know being far too anatomical about this but the iris isn't what you see it wouldn't be what you get blinded with right <laughs> um so yeah yeah i guess as far as that goes that's, that's some sure. general comments yeah i wasn't sure which part anatomy wise of the eye I should choose because none of them flowed quite right. So I was just like, oh, I'll pick one. Oh, uh, well, you picked the color part. You wanted retina, right? I'm pretty sure we want, you know, if you, if you burn anything, you're going to burn your retina. It's cool. what, it's what everyone accused Donald Trump of burning when he looked at the sun. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, this, uh, uh, a couple of things. First, a, a small thing. You talked about uh, the sun's angle optimal for re reflecting hot rays off the sand, um, but then this is morning, and that makes me think of another time of day than this than morning. Um, the uh, so that was a that was that was a cognitive thing. I think your delivery was rough. There's a lot of good things going on in your prose and your delivery was rough. I would encourage you to think about um, having passages that are going to be emphatic and drawn out, then some passages that are going to be sort of like ordinary and the ordinariness supplies kind of the baseline from which to emerge emphatic. Like for example, you've got this this sentence, um, like three lines down, three and four lines down, I'm vulnerable to sunburn from above and below. So that's kind of this aside, right? So you don't deliver that emphatically, you deliver that matter of factly, and that matter of fact baseline will help you um, come out of that to be emphatic. Um, Good, yeah, I think that also may have helped with some of the metaphors I'm complaining with. I, they just didn't have conviction when you delivered them. Uh, yeah, you, yeah, you threw pauses and inflections in odd places. And then I can't help noticing you used the wrong it's here, so I have to call you out in front of everybody. And then morning as well. So, you know, typos, typos, Meyer. No, I'm being critical there. Okay, yeah, good. But, yeah, but he's got a he's got a bum leg, so I don't know. I think you need to have good legs to do apostrophes. Well, there you go. Yeah. Uh, well, I can't see his legs, so I have no mercy. If you were up on a stage hobbling around, then maybe we have a little pathos. But as it is, I don't feel sorry for him in the least. Okay, our next one up is Jane Morgan. Jane. Hello, can you hear me? All right. My fingers are bloodless, caused by the sudden death grip my hand had involuntarily placed on the door. My foot shoots out each toe, vainly in search of the brake, which inhabits the other side of the car. Adrenaline shunts blood into my limbs, preparing them for action, but, alas, 
my body restrained by the seat belts has nowhere to go. Every muscle tense for impact. A yelp manages to squeeze out between my teeth. Katie, Katie, Katie! A sudden jolt jerks my torso forward and then snaps it back into the leather cushion. I slowly exhale and try to pry my fingers off the door handle one by one. I lower the arm which had flung itself up to shield my face and sheepishly look over at my sister. She glowers at me for the sudden eruption of panic. But my reaction was not entirely unjustified. We are so close to the car in front of us that I can't even see the license plate. Our car had been going too fast. Thank you. Great energy, Jane. Very fun. Uh, okay. Now I, I realize that in my comments, I often do the thing that I tell you not to do, which is repeat the obvious. So everybody enjoyed that and had fun with it. I have to say that was fun, good job. Uh, but now with that said, <laughs> let's get into it here. Um, and specifically at the ending right here, do you see where you have overdone our work for us? Our car had been going too fast. I know that's the prompt you're trying to expand for us, mm -hmm. but I, I really do think that you could have left that out and really put a lot of delivery. The car's so close, I can't even see the license plate. You know, okay. and that really gets at the idea. That's really funny because that was a last minute decision to stick that in because I felt like it, someone had told me that it hadn't resolved enough. And okay. so rather than working on just making my tone more resolved. Well, um, I'm, willing to, I'm willing to be disagreed with if you think that's a better way to do it. But yeah, I don't know. Well, Chris, do you want to you wanna settle our debate here? Oh, sorry, muted. Me. I was fine with it. Um, I guess I could go. I could go either way. I, um, the car had been going too fast. It kind of it. It has kind of an orienting and focusing quality to it uh, that I don't mind. But what if she had been able to tie it to Katie? I think if she'd been able to tie this part back to Katie and with the license plate, you know, I looked at Katie or Blair. I don't know, Blair. I don't know. There might be a way to do that. I think that could include with the same amount without having to get quite so general. But at the same time, let's let's skip on from that because it's not that big of a comment. Uh, overall, I thought your delivery really made this fun. The one thing is, I'd say you already you always tend to go fast, and you started about 60 miles an hour in this piece, and then managed to even get up to 80 miles an hour with the Katie 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 part, which was fantastic. So I was worried that you were going so fast that you wouldn't be able to differentiate and make us go even faster because we're afraid we're going to wreck. But you managed it somehow. But I would say if you can start a little slower and ease into it, you know, my fingers are bloodless caused by the sudden death grip. My hand is involuntarily placed on the door. You know, you know, those kind of those kind of things. If you slow down and then get going faster, then you kind of ramp up. That's what Dr. Sleck says about establishing a base level. Um, you know, there's things to be said about involuntarily and sudden. I don't think those strengthen your sentence. You know, my family also in the next sentence while you're at it. Good, thank you, yeah. So those, those are trying to help you do something that you don't need help doing. They're adverbs that are weakening your prose. You already have great verbs here in line. My fingers are bloodless. My hands involuntarily gripped the door. You know, I mean, I can see involuntarily, but I would like it if you could just leave it out. My hands you know, shot out and grab the door. That idea, you could do that in a different way. No, you already used shoot out your foot. But each toe vainly in search for the break, which inhabits the other side of the car. I think if you it's if you punchy sentence this down and cut out those adverbs, you'd really tighten this up. So as far as composition goes, you you know you delivered it really well, but I think you could get even tighter. Yeah, um, Mr. Cole's last comment was, was what I was going to lead with too, and I I really want to reinforce my agreement with him that you really delivered this nicely. It was, it was great. And I think the delivery actually uh, covered up some of the things that, that presented unnecessarily, unnecessary challenges. And, and it is those, those adverbs. Um, let me point out something else that those adverbs do. Um, now, you made the decision, and this is a good decision, um, there are other ways of approaching it. You made the decision to uh, 
narrate the experience as the experience is being experienced, if that makes sense. Like, so this is unfolding and you're talking about your, your feelings and sensations as it's happening. Okay, which is a great decision. Um, but when you, so that, that calls for a certain rigorous adherence to a point of view in order to execute it. And when you start describing things as sudden and involuntary, those are sort of third person descriptions rather than what somebody feels as they're going through it in the moment. Um, now, uh, having said that, um, when we get to the very end, um, the last, I guess, three, three sentences and say, but my reaction was not, not in, was not entirely unjustified. First of all, the double negative is really hard to calculate. You should avoid double negatives if you can. Um, it's also kind of an assessment. And I really like that we've just lived through this scene and now this line moves us into kind of analysis and, and sort of coming to rest, which I think is good. Um, but then you lurch back into, we're so, uh, I don't know, uh, we're back to re-experiencing and analyzing. I would encourage you to have a complete shift to analyzing now. Um, so anyway, hopefully that made sense. Yeah, any thoughts or questions, Jane? I think what Dr. S and everybody else, what Dr. Select is saying about the difference between experiencing and telling about it is really key to how you decide to tell a story. So do, do ask if you've got questions on those things. I think I'm good, but thank you. Good. All right. Next up, we've got Nate Miller. All righty. The rain splattering into our car headlights reminded me of light speed. My eyes itched when I blinked. The seatbelt bit into my collarbone. I looked up at dad. We weren't home yet. Why were we stopping? He whispered something, a bad word. No, maybe a prayer. I scooted up to see over the dashboard. Three others had been shorn off at the roots and a good 10 feet of the guardrail was gone. We opened our doors. The rain and the taste of burnt rubber woke me up completely. Dad gave me his warm phone that told me to call 911 and then slid carefully into the ravine. I could barely make him out in our car's headlights. I told them we were at that bend in the old highway. They knew which one it was. Then I turned on the phone light and pointed it down the hill. My neighbor's truck, the one named Bluebell, steamed and ticked after that after that we didn't play around bluebell bend thank you okay nate claps virtual claps uh, i had some uh lag issues with with listening to you um that's all right i uh, i it's it's just a reminder that we are not yet in the post millennial future where everything works perfectly. Uh, so uh, yeah, the cursed, the cursed internet. Like your dad, we are whispering words under our breath. Um, cussed. <laughs> oh, cussed. <laughs> cursed. Different, both the same. Uh, yeah, okay, so I, I thought your delivery was very strong, Nate. I, uh, I like seeing you go with a different direction of delivery. So you went with a sad, you know, painful one with breaks in the voice and a lot, very slow pace and a lot of breaking and that's not as easy to do so i thought you took my challenge to heart about trying different styles of delivery and i think the sad one for the most part worked um i think the last line the only one that didn't really come across the way that you wanted wanted it to you know it's sort of a childlike sort of 
reflection on after that, we didn't play around Bluebell Bend because our neighbor died there, or, you know, is what I'm into. I don't know if he died, you know, even if he just wrecked. Um, I think that's sort of the approach. But let's, let's pull up your piece because you had some, this had some good things going for it. Um, you're telling a story, right? It's, it's in the past, but we're, you're telling about it. We're walking through it as we go as in our, in our, um, uh, you, you're telling as we're looking back on the experience, I thought it went well. Uh, I would say your prompts, the car was going too fast, especially coming right after Jane's. It's fun to compare the two. Um, yours is much more about an accident and discovering an accident than it is about the speed of the car, right? Uh, I guess yeah. your car, I mean, I, you, I assume you did that on purpose. But. Yeah, so in uh, Dr. Schleck's advice, he said you could focus on the results. So I wanted to do like three immediate results and then results like in the future. Good. Yep. I think that's a fun approach. I like seeing the way that the result works. Uh, it, I wouldn't say it immediately makes me think about speed, right? Because we don't really know why he, he crashed. Per se. You know, I mean, it's not tied directly to that. But I'm not complaining. I'm more just observing. Because I like to look at the differences between what, what approach we're taking for Copia and, and those different. Chris, do you have anything that you can you can come in and rescue me from my word salad that I'm creating right now? Yeah. I don't think there's any. <laughs> <laughs> there's no rescuing. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, just let's distract everyone, please. <laughs> That's right. One thing um, I'll highlight. Uh, one thing I thought was was quite good. One line that's hard to deliver well that you delivered quite well, um, and that's late when you're calling nine one one. You said, I told them they were at that bend in the old highway, they knew which one it was. There's a change in voice, a change in speaker, a change in actor. Um, that's got to be delivered. Well, that actually sets a high bar for to, to deliver it coherently, and I thought you met it. Um, that was really good. Um, and I want to highlight, I bet, you know, it was so eased, it, it was delivered with such ease that I don't think it was noticed but I know that that's hard to deliver well. So I just wanted to comment like that. Um, the, uh, now, stepping back from this whole thing, I guess I'm struggling to understand where you are. Were you, were you in the car when the accident happened? Are you part of the rescue coming upon the accident? Um, you know, you have dad sliding into the ravine. Uh, I'm trying to figure out, you know, so it looks like you're in a car at the, from the beginning, you know, you're looking up over the dashboard. Um, but then it's, uh, and then it's really weird. The, like the taste of burnt rubber woke you up completely. Um, like you were, you were asleep through a wild incident and then later on you woke up. No, I think it's what it is, is the dad is sliding into the ravine on his two feet but it can be taken as, because they stop, he gets out of the car and then slides into the ravine, is that correct? But the sliding into the ravine can be taken as the dad's car. Oh, I didn't think of that. Yeah, he was supposed to be sliding into the ravine uh, to go and rescue them. To rescue someone else. That's right, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, so I, I had a hard time um, following whether you were in the car that was experiencing the malady or whether you were in the car that was coming upon the malady, um, if that makes sense. So. Good, okay, uh, fun approach there with the result-centered copia. Uh, I like that approach. Instead of putting, you know, I, I like that, I, again, I've said before, I don't like clumsy narrative frames, I do like however well handled one. So you took just a chunk right at the very end of the segment to try to communicate it. I don't think it quite worked all the way, but I like the approach. Yeah, uh, I think it works. Good. Yeah, thanks, Nate. All right, Greta, you're up next. All right, can you hear me okay? Okay. I listened to my heart thumping, to my feet pounding, to the steady inhale and exhale of my breathing, 
The finish line was nearly ahead, but I could go on for miles. The red tape and small band of parents came into view when a black speck made a beeline for my cornea. The collision was inevitable. Instantly, my eye shut. My hand reached for my face. Like instinct, my sweaty palm started to rub the source of irritation. No relief. Half running, half stumbling, I willed the tiniest space to open between my puffy eyelids. Each attempt was followed by a jolting shut. My eye eventually built up to a wild flutter and then a sustained opening. The dam that once held back salty tears gave way and I fumbled over the red tape. I finished. Ah, fun. The expansion of the old gnat in the eye sentence. Fun stuff. Okay, Greta. So um, let's look at this right here. Uh, Talis, you'll take notes that Greta knows the right word for the part of the eye that the gnat was flying into. Um, no, <laughs> just giving you a hard time. Uh, yeah, okay, so Greta, I think you should move this to the present tense because you really want us to feel it with you. And I don't think you're doing enough re re or remove narration to, to, to justify the distance created by the past tense or uh, 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 something set in the past. So I think you go much closer. I listen to my heart thumping, my feet pounding, the steady inhale and exhale of my breathing. The, and, I, and then I think if you go that way, we really are gonna feel the, the, the gnat in the eye with you. Um, the other thing I'll talk about is that you actually do a good job. The organizing principle of your piece is actually uh, an emotional one. You start on a high and end on a low. And that's actually what people tend to say is a great way to do chapters. If you're writing chapters in a book, you want to start on a low note and end on a high. Or if you start on a high note at the beginning of a chapter, you want to end on a low. And that's just generally a way to make sure each chapter flows. So I wanted to say that organizing principle works. Um, I'm looking, I'm, I'm looking at your descriptions here exactly of what you're talking about, and I'm not quite following all of those. Um, I willed the tiniest space to open between my puffy eyelid. Uh, well, eyelids, I would assume that'd be eyelids. Each yeah. attempt was followed by a jolting shut. I, I didn't, a jolting closure or them jolting shut. I just wasn't quite tracking exactly built up to a wild flutter. You just have some articles used here with some nouns in a way that made them a little unusual. I, I wasn't quite sure if I, I was tracking with it. I liked a few of them, but I think all together in a row made me feel uh, like I wasn't quite sure, wasn't quite tracking. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I would, yeah, that one's supposed to be plural. I talk okay, that good. later, but yeah. Good. Well, you yeah. Said sense. good, no, that's fine. Uh, you might have said that. I'm just looking at it now, so that's fine. Okay, Doctor Select. I uh, I enjoyed this, Greta. This was this was fun. I agree with uh, Mr. Cole's comment, um, and that is the the temporal point of view was uh, I think could have been more definitely like narrating a past event. And of course, sometimes when you when you experience something. Um, and then you're telling about it again, oftentimes you re-experience. Um, and, uh, but the, uh, a lot of the past tense in the first paragraph, uh, as actually I listened, it kind of sets us up, it's past tense, but then it's this present action. Um, then uh, I stumbled over uh, in the second paragraph, like instinct, the palm of my sweaty hand started to rub. That was strange because it seems like you're setting up a simile, like instinct, <laughs> but maybe it was instinct. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I'll just, uh, I wonder if, uh, like Mr. Cole has scratched it out, which uh, was probably how the eye was feeling at this time. Um, but I think if you just remove it, it's much, much better. Um, so anyway, there we go. Uh, but I enjoyed it. It was a it was a fun piece. I, I felt uh, I felt my eyes itching. So <laughs> good. Thank you, Greta. On to the next one. 
Oh, uh, yeah, on the next one. Ella, that's your turn. Okay. <clears throat> Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Oh, that was a thumbs up. Okay. She stared in the mirror, sighed, and refocused on pretty much her sole task for this beautiful lockdown day, doing her hair. As the hashtag got dressed anyway became popular and people's laziness was highlighted by messy buns, Jill was working hard to recover a true Renaissance beauty. Two weeks of untouched hair crowded in millions of tangles around her skull. She ripped a brush through it for 30 minutes, rested her arms for 10, continued brushing for another 15, and stared at her now poofy reflection. Accomplishment. She flipped through Pinterest Renaissance hairstyles for the next hour before looking at the clock. She realized it was past 11 and gave up. She braided her hair. Okay, fun stuff. Uh, okay, so jumping into expanding something that's a specific sort of daily action dependent uh, and trying to expand that into a full piece, you made this sort of as the compromise. So we entered expecting an exciting Renaissance hairstyle, and then we ended with just the regular old braid, not even a French braid, despite the Renaissance. Um, so I thought, I, thought, I thought that's kind of a fun approach, taking a bit of a sketch. So this one here would be sketching a, a, a character and attempting to make the braiding the focal point of this character. Um, and I thought the hair treatment was handled well. I thought the, the 30, 10, 15 was, was a fun numerical addition here. Um, I almost wanted you to tell me more about Pinterest Renaissance hairstyles. Uh, I was not aware of such a thing, but that may be because of, well, who I am. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know if that would have drawn away from the point of braiding, but I do, I do wonder uh, I guess the main thing I'm saying is I feel like it needed a little more because when you jumped into this, this trending stuff right here felt a bit out of place because it's not really about Jill. I mean, it is why Jill is working hard to recover a true Renaissance beauty, but I don't think that the, the sort of backdrop as this trended while this was going on fits in the moment. It kind of rips us out of the moment. So that would be my biggest critique here is that I think you need to, uh, try to get more quickly into the hair and then stay in the hair just a touch longer so that you can conclude with the braiding in a way that feels like that necessary compromise. Yeah, um, yeah and I think I might, uh, I'm reacting to the same thing Mr. Cole's reacting to, but I might uh, resolve it a little bit differently. I like the gut dressed anyway stuff. The, the problem, I think, was um, that it's kind of an aside and it's, and it's, it's an explanatory note. And so it should have been delivered as an aside and an explanatory note. Um, so the problem was that you, you have a, your delivery was there in the moment of staring in the mirror side and so forth. Um, and you also have following that coda, the two weeks of untouched hair, what you need to do is break into kind of narrative voice through that passage that Mr. Cole highlighted, um, and then resume the action voice. Uh, but what you did is you held the action voice clear through it um, when you delivered it, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, so that's, so I, I like its presence there. Um, but I think that might have been one of the resolutions to uh, a possible resolu resolution to what Mr. Cole was thinking about. I don't know. What do you think, Brian? Yep, I think you're right. I, I, I will occasionally do this, but I remove my objection to it. I think you just do need to couch it a little better. Uh, part of the reason I remove it, too, is that I like the specificity of it. So I think it contrasts nicely and gives us a setup for the current cultural situation, right. whereas some of your other stuff, you know, ripping a brush is a good verb, but then resting, continued brushing are pretty instared. 
you know, the poofy reflection is nice, but I, I would say you could, you can put more specificity into this description. And so I think, I think he, Dr. Schlecht is right to say it's delivery, don't remove it. Do you right. think it would work to put it at the beginning and that way it would be more like narration and then the story? Um, I think that the, you, you could play with that. That's, that. that's worth trying, but I think you could, get away with it as is, it just then creates the onus on yourself. You might remember previously when I was talking to Nate um, about how Nate related a phone call and delivered the voices well, it's hard to do. But I also think, I, I think that you are good and quite a capable deliverer. So I think that you're up to it. Um, I think that this is, I think that execution is really hard to kind of change mood right here, but I think you can do it. Thank you. Uh, uh, Ella, any comments before we move on? What's the, what's the best Renaissance hairstyle? Now I'm really curious. I feel like it's just a general um, category, like those ones you see that Anything from like a bun that's like two feet tall to like uh, braids and every other piece of hair, I think. Okay, nice. Lots of braids or two foot tall buns. I can tell you. <laughs> Thank you for helping me out. Everyone's racing to Pinterest now to check out. <laughs> it's truly impressive. I'll get to two feet soon, sooner or later. Uh, okay. Okay, next one up is Adam. There we go. All right, can you hear me? All right. It was quiet. Quiet enough that the lights burned your eyes. Quiet enough to feel the heaviness of every breath from every player on the field. How long have you been standing here? before this pentagonal monster that dangles victory just out of reach. Three balls, two strikes. You fought nine innings to stand here. Two outs. There's not going to be another chance. Base is loaded. This is it. Sixty feet out, the pitcher begins his motion. But as his leg lifts, you notice a glint in his eye. A glint of doubt. Immediately, confidence overtakes any fear you may have had, and that devilish half-smile creeps across your face. What was once doubt blossoms into fear as the sight of your condescending smirk sends chills through his bones. Everything slows down. The ball is 30 feet away in closing. The unsettled pitcher had missed his target, and now it was streaming right down the middle. The sound of leather ricocheting off metal breaks your smirk into a toothy grin. That one's out of here. Thank you. All right, we've got a little, we've, we're clearly all missing baseball together. So I'm glad we get to experience it together with the piece. Um, I thought your delivery of slow down was nice. It had a little bit, of, it was almost cinematic in its form. Slow down, yeah. I thought that worked well. So a fun attempt at varying your delivery. Um, however, the you, you, you didn't ever commit to the second person because you then continue kind of to tell what's going on in the pitcher's mind, right? And I really would doubt that if, as you are watching the pitch come and you're smiling, it, I, I just feel like you notice a glint in his eye, a glint of doubt, and you have confidence, and then you smile, and then he has doubt blossoming into fear, and then your condescending smirk is sending chills through his bones, and this is all while the pitch is coming, or at least the windup, right? Uh, so the, well, no, it's actually while the ball's in the air. So I think as far as that narration technique goes, if you're going to go with you, I, I don't think you can get away with then jumping into his head 
and then jumping into your head and then jumping into his head again. I think you would need to either break it out entirely and tell it from a third point of view or tell it you looking back on it, telling that story. But the present tense experiential approach doesn't really work with you then jumping into his head. That's just not how narration works. Um, so that would be my main comment about this. Um, uh, the home plate is the pentagonal monster that dangles victory is an intense metaphor, but I almost wonder if it's not quite out of place or if it's a little out of place here, right? Just because it's so dramatic. I was, I was trying to make it extra intense because of the situation. Yeah. And that's a, that's a good, that's a good desire. I think that's a good desire to try to make it intense. I'm not sure like the inflated metaphor is the way to go. Um, I like the quietness of the stand, despite the presence of all the people watching. You know, I think, I think that could work. Although, I'm not sure what quietness has to do with lights burning eyes. Yeah, exactly. I did. I also was wondering about that. Well, it, I, I like, I like, I like lights. I like, like that. Like, like you notice it. Like it, you can feel the lights extra because there aren't any other. There's nothing. You're not receiving anything else. That your ex, your explanation makes sense, but I think that that had to be explained in order for it to make sense. Um, so uh, you've got you're discussing two different senses there: the tactile sense of burning, and the, then the silence of hearing, um, and uh, and it's a lot to process. I think you you force the reader to or hearer to calculate. Um, one thing I'll comment, this is a, this is a challenge here too. The, so the prompt is he smirked and I'm not sure that this is, you know, the, you're, you're painting a scene here in which a smirk occurs, but are you adorning smirk? Um, is the smirk at the center of this story? Um, so i I don't know. My my attention was uh, was not or, ordered around the smirk. Um, although I think with some slight adjustments that can be uh, that can be addressed. Yeah, obviously one of the goals. Well, we talked about this. One of the goals would be to try and be able to, if you came into the need to describe smirking in another situation, that you could get that smirking smirkiness fully inflated and kind of transported. And this one really does rely entirely on the pitcher, the pitching battle. So this almost feels like more of defeating, defeating a smirking dude by crushing up a monster Homer to win the game. Um, uh, you know, so so that's a couple things to think about as as far as that goes. Is there a way to focus even more on the smirks? Well, part of it is I think we've got uh, competing smirks here, too. Like you've got uh, the glint in his eye or. There's there's other eye things that are going on um, that are that make the the fact that you're smirking incidental. Yeah. Any thoughts, Adam? Um, I was just I was trying to make the smirk the the like send the turning point of the pe like the focus the focused point where everything kind of switched. But I I yeah I understand that I didn't like put quite enough emphasis on it and that I had a lot of things around it that were about the same energy so yeah that's good I analysis think, yeah I, I think you're right and the and the the way to resolve it is not to change this the smirk line it's to change the setup to it um, it's to change the surroundings of it right and I, although I do feel like <laughs> that devilish half smile feels almost like a line out of a romance novel. Not that I've read a lot of romance novels, but, but uh, you know, that devilish half smile. I mean, it made me feel a little bit, um, it felt a little, uh, what's the word? It's just a bit cliche. I, w I had a hard time picturing what the devilish half smile It was meant. a little harlequin. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, there we go. There's the right word. Yeah. <laughs> um, it felt a bit dramatic and especially because it was saying you, you know, that devilish half smile that creeps across your face. I was like, I can't recall giving devilish half smiles particularly often while playing baseball, but it's possible. 
maybe Adam is a devilish half smiler. He probably is. Of all the people in our class, probably Adam is. We'll see. We may get a witness from in the chat. Oh, okay. All right. Well, Corbin thinks that your was a, as a switching point made sense. So take it or leave it. There's some good thoughts for you to go with. Uh, thank you, Adam. Next up, we are on to Cheyenne. Hello. Can everybody hear me? Can. Okay. Cool. Sorry, children. She considers the wild curls piled hastily by pencil cramped hands. She could tough it out and contain it now, or she could, yet again, just go to bed and make it work in the morning. <sighs> it wouldn't last another night, though, if she worked quickly, she just might finish within the hour. Section, detangle, twist, 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 repeat. Seven songs and three sections later, her mother's threats sound like a saving grace as she dissects another snarl with a heart-wricking snap. What if she cut it all off? No, she didn't have the bone structure. What the juck, is that a bobby pin she missed last wash day? Oh, Mother Mary, the curls it had mangled. Snap! Yea, though I comb through the jungle of coils, I shall fear no tales. She mantras as she twists and parts and twists and parts until she finishes half. She shakes off the work of the better part of an hour, six neat gleaming ebony plates juxtaposes against the adjacent loose gravity-defying abundance. What if she buzzed it? Thank you. Uh, very fun, Cheyenne. Uh, virtual claps all around. Yeah, super fun. Uh, I, I think, uh, I guess I didn't realize as I included this prompt. Oh, there's Grace. Grace is clapping. Um, yeah, so as a, I didn't realize that braiding is such a thing. I guess I should have. I'm being stupidly male here, but I guess I, I thought you did a great job with an experiential thing of walking us through the difficulty of this. I especially thought that keyed in on your delivery and the repetition of the phrases twists etc where you're doing that so as far as that goes your organizing principle worked really well i also thought your humor came through well benefiting the benefiting the prompt here with the occasions of the snaps and what's going on with this and that and the sort of internal the in, internal monologue it really did feel experiential in that way because that's what you're trying to do you're not telling us about this one time i braided my hair you're helping us experience how difficult it is to section detangle twist 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 repeat yeah so i like that great work yeah um Cheyenne, this this was a lot of fun again you're uh i think it's it's well constructed and then you also delivered something that was well constructed very well um the uh i like the again section detangle twist 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 um i i am the father of daughters and it was interesting i remember sometimes the task would fall to me when the girls were little um and then that that would never last long it would be brenda's job <laughs> um but uh anyway i i love the shout out to song 23 um that was so uh it was it wasn't um, too overt. It was subtle enough yet clear. Um, that was, was very good. Um, and then uh, your delivery, just what it, you delivered a number of things well, but one that I'll highlight is so just following the Psalm 23, you say half. She shakes out the work of the better part of an hour. And then you say six neat gleaming ebony plates. Um, and then when you say juxtaposes, this the six neat gleaming ebony plates um, was delivered in one way, and then you've got juxtaposes, and then the adjacent loose gravity defying abundance. Um, you deliver that contrast with your voice remarkably well, and that's just one example of a number of things that were uh, that were really good. So, anyway, nicely done. Any thoughts, Cheyenne, or questions or observations? 
we're pretty open at this point of the declamation. I mean, I tried to make it since I knew that I was delivering to you and Dr. Schlecht that there were so many things dividing this experience from you guys. So I just tried to make it as relatable as possible. Um, so does it, I mean, I was thinking about my, the organizing of my actual piece. So if you're trying, cause I know we don't always have to rely on delivery. So do you recommend that we try to like, I guess put how we tried to deliver it in the actual piece. So like with the italics and then the snap in the middle of it, or does it really matter? That doesn't matter. I, at this point, I think you can include what you want. I don't want you, the italics are nice. You know, this, this, that's, that's fine. I wouldn't want you to include stuff like crescendo or like get quiet here or pause, you know, but, but as far as this concern, whatever makes it easiest for you to deliver. Yeah. Right. Yep. Good. What? Oh. Oh, go for it. So I'll just say, I, I gave you, I got to give one, one comment. You have um, the, the very opening sentence. She considers the wild curls piled hastily by pencil cramped hands. There's a lot going in that sentence. And I, I would just take out hastily um, or pencil cramped or something like there's wild curls hastily. That, uh, too many images there. Um, yeah. So. I mean, I think we, uh, if you guys are aware, there's the Hemingway counter online. You can put any of your pros into, not that we want to write like Hemingway, but you can put any of your pros into the Hemingway counter and it will tell you how many adverbs you have and that you should remove them. And so, so that's the general approach right there. I did think it, that I will comment that first sentence, especially as an entry into this, was something that did take some unraveling. Um, I was thinking in my head back to that one and wait, what was that? Um, but yeah, otherwise, good stuff. Okay, last but not least, Sydney Samau. Can you guys hear me okay? <clears throat> okay. The morning was bright. Perhaps that's why I was so annoyed. I always set my alarm for 6 a.m. the night before to feel good about myself. But really, it's just because I'm not above lying, even as the last thing I do before I go to sleep at night. Then I set six alarms after that, spaced 10 minutes apart. The alarms give me some time to just lie in bed and be angry and wish I had a butler who could magically make a hot, black, bitter cup of coffee appear. Or better yet, a Mr. Jeeves with one of those brews he makes with spices and raw eggs that make you feel alive because it brings you just that close to death. I roll over and my eyes are assaulted by a stack of books. Calvin, Seton, City of God, the size of a brick literally from that city. Why is the alarm ringing again? Oh right, I press snooze, Freudian slip. I throw off the covers and squint my eyes only 14 hours and 28 minutes before I can go to sleep again. Uh, fun stuff, Sydney. Okay, uh, so of course you're expanding the prompt. The morning was bright. Um, and, and I don't know that it really did focus specifically on the brightness of the morning, but I think we enjoyed it anyway. Uh, you do start with it and end with it. So perhaps I think we're at the point where you're at the last deliverer, and so we're willing to let things slide. Um, but it did. It was much more about alarms and wanting coffee. I thought the daydream was pretty nice or whatever it's called right at the beginning of the morning. Um, I, I, I thought this was pretty fun. So I also will, will congratulate you on whatever you did to make this work. It may have been your delivery. You tend to have good delivery, but you were able to move on to three or four extremely different things in a single 175 words, which usually is a recipe for disaster. But here you talk about, you know, the strategy for setting alarms. You also talk about Mr. Jeeves and various brews as well as butlers and different kinds of coffee. So that's a, that's a beefy paragraph. And then you move on to books, and then you kind of conclude things with uh, the, the counting down to more sleeping. So 
I think it has to do, as I'm looking at this, it has to do with excellent opening sentences because you're connecting each piece to the next with a, with a quick or sudden reference that ties us into the other piece. So each piece is kind of sewed together nicely. Um, so yeah, that's a bit of a critique along with your compliment. It's not really about the morning being bright. Uh, you know, a morning in Hawaii, you could write about a bright morning. You more wrote about just morning in general. But the, you know, we're at the point where we'll probably give you a pass. Sydney, this was, this was a lot of fun. You did, um, uh, again, just to reinforce what Mr. Cole said, you set up a challenge for yourself by having several different moments that you describe, but you move through them in a logical sequence so that it worked. Um, this, it would be easy to get lost in, in this short of space, but I did feel lost. Um, I will say, uh, that your delivery is is really good. I would encourage you at a couple of moments to uh, pause longer um, when you have when you have breaks. Um, so, like for example, uh, toward the beginning here, I always set my alarm for six a.m. the night before to feel good of my to feel good about myself. And then you need the, a longer pause. And then you go, but really, it's because you otherwise you've got a good vocal, you, you did have a good vocal change and shift there, um, but underscore the change by like 1001, 1002, but really it's because that kind of thing. Um, and there are a couple of other places where I think the pause could have been stronger. Um, and I'm fishing for com uh, these comments because I think that uh, you deliver naturally very, very good. Um, yeah, and if I can give a tiny little pedantic one as well, um, this is a bit tricky to tell which lying we're talking about. Um, I'm not above lying down, even as the last thing I do before I sleep. You have this moment of like, wait, but everyone's lying down when they go to sleep, right? Uh, so I don't know, lying to myself might be a good addition to, to there, but that's so tiny. Yeah, I, um, I was going to comment on that too, that I, I had to kind of calculate what you meant there, the two versions of lying, and then what was the what was the lie? You said you set yourself your alarm for six a.m. Are you one of those people who who sets your clock uh, not at the actual time, or is it or the presence of snoozes? Um, that was another one of these moments where I just kind of had to calculate um, what was happening. So I'm curious what form of lying you were you had in view. Yeah, I mean it was exaggerated, but I definitely set my first alarm before I actually have to get up. And so that's what I was meaning, like, yeah, I'm gonna set my alarm for six as if I'll get up at that time, but we all know that's not gonna happen. That's okay. Sort of thing. Good. And it's a it's a great idea and I like the and I like the lying um, to um, just maybe a couple more cues to disclose to the to your hearer um, what was happening there um, so anyway but I thought it was very good these are just uh, nitpicky comments on something I really thought was delightful good you have you know, we now have all the prospective students hearing Dr. Schlecht saying that he likes all the lying <laughs> so, no. as the Dean of Student Affairs <laughs> that's so, right yeah good work Okay. Well, and, and Sydney can pull the wool, pull the wool over her own eyes successfully, and then that's an accomplishment, though. There you go. Okay. Any last comments from anybody before we release you back into the wilds of your evening? Dinner time, I suppose, or perhaps later for some of you East Coasters. No, I think everyone's done. Okay, guys. Thank you, prospective students, for attending. Great work. You group B folks, a lot of fun seeing those and I love to see what you guys are coming up with. So uh, I'll see you next week for your papers. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.